Spitfire was modified and in 1942 was successfully landed on the deck of HMS Victorious by Lieutenant Commander Bramble. Many technical problems had to be faced and overcome to fit the Spitfire for carrier operations. I loved the Seafire. Uh, I thought it was a lovely aeroplane, which it was really a converted uh, Spitfire with a hook on. Put on the back end and uh, the balance of the hook was made up with a lump of lead put either side of the engine. I was sent straight to the first naval Spitfire squadron, Seafire squadron. We went straight to the Med, 1942. Seafires in the Navy, of course, were actually RAF Spitfires, uh, renamed and very slightly altered to make them capable of uh, deck operations. They were very similar. Well, of course, it was, the Seafire was basically a Spitfire, and because of the extra weight involved with the arrestor gear and catapult spools, one thing or the other, um, they were about ten knots slower than the equivalent Spitfire mark. Other than that, they flew exactly the same as the Spitfire. Yeah. But it was quite a... The, the early ones were definitely were converted ones. Because by putting a hook on, they meant they had to strengthen the fuselage to take the pull of the hook, which upset the centre of gravity of the Spitfire. So, in fact, they bolted lead weights onto the onto the, onto the engine. Uh, then uh, they used to bolt one or two on each side of the engine. And then the pilot had to take the aircraft up to see how it flew. And if it flew a bit tail heavy, they put an extra weight on. If it flew nose heavy, they take a weight off until you got it right. So it was really that almost Heath Robinson type of thing to start with in the early days. Yeah. And it was a very reliable aircraft. The Rolls-Royce engines are very reliable. And of course, one has to bear in mind that the uh, Spitfire was never designed for the Navy anyway. So it had uh, structural problems mainly, mainly with the undercarriage. The, the undercarriage wasn't really uh, uh, built and it wasn't tough enough to, to take uh, deck landings really. That was the main fault with it. The sea fires were such a wizard, wonderful, uh, wizard is the in word in those days. <laughs> uh, wonderful aircraft to fly. Well, it was so light and so wonderfully uh, easy to control. Uh, you'd only, the stick was a very, very light touch and it would, it would respond straight away. I think they, these were, there were several marks of Seafire. L, L2C, I think, was the ones we were, certainly that's what we meant when I went operational, and then L3. Um, they were always improving them with the, it was a Merlin engine to begin with. I think later they had a Griffin, which was a 2,000 horsepower, but the Merlin, I think, was 1,750 horsepower, um, which gave you a tremendous boost. One exercise we did was to see how high we could go. Oxygen testing got up to 30,000, 31,000, I think. Um, at that altitude, the air is so thin you know, that the, you lose control, really, uh, of conventional aircraft. Seafire's one, one big disadvantage was its endurance. It, only, it was only, only about three-quarters of an hour fuel. Um, which we overcame on reconnaissance, non-combatant work by putting a, a jet tank, a jettison tank underneath, which would give you another half an hour or so. Uh, but then if you had that, then you couldn't carry much armor or much uh, in the weight of, of uh, uh, the, the uh, guns or, or ammunition. These new aircraft that we received in Northern Ireland were very exciting to us because they were a, quite a considerable advance on our L2s, which we had now disposed of. They had a more powerful engine, and the engines were rated, that is to say, developed their maximum power at an altitude of about 5,000 feet, 
as opposed to an altitude of about 15,000 feet in the L2. In these aircraft were known as the L2C. They were very fast indeed at low altitude and had a tremendous rate of climb. In fact, we were advised that they had the highest performance of any aircraft in the world in the, the uh, altitude band naught to 15,000 feet, which of course was very much to boost our morale and confidence. Furthermore, they were heavier than the previous aircraft, and that meant that they stalled at a slightly higher speed and they were easier to deck land. Curiously enough, it's often thought that the Spit Spitfire type of aircraft being very light and having a very low landing speed would be easier to deck landing, but in fact it wasn't because it had a tendency to be difficult to force into the stall to make a, a clean landing. Whereas the heavier versions which came on afterwards um, were easier to deck land because the stall was more positive so that one could judge what the stalling speed was going to be on the approach and this was a critical factor in deck landing of course where you had to get your aircraft down cleanly in a distance of something less than a hundred feet on the flight deck so this was a good aircraft and very popular But the thing was um, so pilot friendly in every way, except in the deck landing mode, where it was very difficult. But as an aeroplane to fly, it was a delight to fly. Uh, it, it just seemed to do everything that you wanted it to do. It was so easy to manoeuvre. And with the Rolls-Royce engine, I tell you, we had unlimited confidence in flying the aircraft. Uh, when we were in 899 Squadron, we had with us a Rolls-Royce representative with the squadron, and uh, he said to us, well, this aeroplane that you've got is a low-level aircraft. It's got a Merlin 55M motor, uh, which gave about 1,550 horsepower and 18 pounds of boost. And we said, really, in reality, how often can we use the 18 pounds of boost? He said, whenever you like, for as long as you like. Don't worry about what it says in any manual. Use full throttle any time and every time you feel it's necessary. Uh, he said, you've got 85 gallons of fuel on board. At full throttle, it burns 150 gallons an hour. You're not going to be using full throttle for longer than you find it necessary. But don't worry about two-minute limitations. He said, the motor will stand it. The only thing that you get to an overheating position, if you use it, uh, at, uh, depending on altitude, of course, uh, for too long. But he said to us, and that gave us an awful lot of confidence that the man could say that you could use full throttle forever. The new Messerschmitt 109s, which were coming into service, and also the Focke-Wulf 190s, which had very high performance, had to be watched awfully closely in the Spitfire series because we had reached a, a period now where there was almost equality in performance, so that much more depended on the skill of the pilot and on keeping the performance of the aircraft to the maximum. So on RAF recommendation, we proceeded to make minor local alterations to our aircraft. For example, we all went off and bought tins of good quality furniture polish and proceeded to spend hours polishing the leading edges of our, the wings on our aircraft until they shone like an antique piece of furniture. This made the airflow smoother over the wings and improved the turning performance and the top speed. We also took off the exhaust manifolds, which were uh, 
set in sets of six. Uh, the, the engine, the Merlin engine in the aircraft being a 12-cylinder engine, had the exhausts coupled in pairs to six manifolds. Now, these manifolds were quite large and created air resistance. These were all removed and replaced by what we call stub exhaust, 12 little short exhausts, one to each cylinder. This, again, reduced drag and increased the thrust that one got from the exhaust system coming out of the engine. And the last thing was that on these naval aircraft, um, there were some knobs sticking out of the side of the fuselage which were uh, fitted with strengthening to enable the aircraft to be launched by catapult. But as the aircraft had such a tremendous takeoff performance, it was never necessary to use the catapult. So we removed all these knobs from the side of the fuselage too, and this again reduced drag. The final thing was we took the wingtips off, thus ruining the very beautiful Spitfire wing form and producing a chopped effect on the end of the wings. And where the tip had been taken off, a simple fillet was fitted in to, so that the airflow over the tip was smooth. Now this had the effect of giving the aircraft another 15 knots of top speed, of putting the stalling speed up by another 5 knots, and making the rate of roll double what it had been with the wingtips on, all of which made it not only a much more combative aircraft to go into battle with the German fighters, but it made it a much better deck landing aircraft too, because the increase in stalling speed and the very quick stall which took place with the lack, without the wingtips meant that one could be even more positive about putting it down on the flight deck in an exact spot. What dates are we talking about that these modifications were made, please? These uh, took place in May to June 1943. Later, I must say, the, uh, the wingtips were put on again. Uh, the reason was that the rate of roll had been improved by improvements to the ailerons. And in any case, as the weight of the aircraft was increasing all the time through modification and, and, and the fitting of extra um, equipment, the question of the stalling speed had, so to speak, uh, changed its path on the curve and had begun to go down rather than up and it was necessary to put the wingtips on to prevent the stalling speed going any further up the scale. Uh, HMS Formidable arrived in port and I was uh, moved to 885 Squadron, which was the Seafire Squadron on board. Um, and so we were a squadron of only five aircraft, and we were parked on deck with outriggers over the starboard side of the vessel, just holding the tail wheel, and the two main wheels just at the edge of the deck. Yes, we were, on, we were doing high-level patrols, because the, the Grumman martlets were more useful at uh, lower altitude, and somebody had to be able to do high altitude patrols. The uh, the uh, ruler class carriers that went in there, uh, mostly with uh, sea fires on board, were doing the ground attack operation uh, because the Royal Air Force couldn't cover uh, that operation. It was far too far away from North Africa, so the Navy had to do the cover until such time as the Army had landed and secured bases in order to fly in RAF or USAF squadrons into the landing fields. So the initial landings were all covered by Navy. 
we had a higher altitude capability than some of the other aircraft, and this was uh, this was useful because if they're going to send over uh, photo reconnaissance aircraft, then they needed somebody able to uh, uh, attack them. I would say the main reason for 885 Squadron being on Formidable was to give that high altitude capability because we didn't have it with the other aircraft that were there and the Germans used to use JU-88s to come over on photo reconnaissance and uh, if they knew that, that we had high altitude aircraft that could take off and reach their altitudes then if they got advice from their radar that we're on the way then they were deterred um, our aircraft incidentally uh, never went into the hangar the, the lifts on HMS Formidable wouldn't take uh, Spitfire and we didn't have folding wings at this stage we had Spitfire 2's and we had one other difference uh, we're a squadron with fitted with catapult spools and uh, we could be catapulted off HMS Formidable and we were on occasions uh, we could fly off or be catapulted off but the the C Fire 1 didn't have catapult spools and the C Fire 3 was never fitted with catapult spools it was never envisaged that they would be catapulted but we were we had these uh, a marker Spitfire, of course, the Seafire L2C, which had very superior performance at low level. The RAF squadrons were flying Spitfire 9s, which had very superior performance at very high level, having been um, having been fitted with engines um, designed primarily for the interception of high level bombing raids and to combat fighter escorts at high level. So there were a number of occasions when low level performance was required and others when high level performance was required. So we just flew each other's aircraft. When we were doing strafing and bombing runs, the sea fires were the popular ones to fly. When we were on escort duties, escorting uh, bombers flying north to attack behind the German lines, we chose this, the Spitfire 9, so it was the most remarkable bit of cooperation. Why do you think the Spitfire was a failure as a fleet air on thing? Oh, for two fundamental reasons. It was too delicate an airplane for a very harsh environment. Um, when you fly an airplane onto the deck of an aircraft carrier, <clears throat> you're plucked out of the sky. Um, when you're doing about 90 miles an hour and crashed onto a deck with, without much um, delicacy, the aircraft is subjected to huge strains in both retardation and in vertical velocity <clears throat> and it has to be specifically designed to meet these very harsh requirements. The Seafire, that is the naval version of the Spitfire, was never designed for this sort of work, it was adapted to it. Second thing was it had really quite appalling view when you were coming in to deck land because well, you must realise you're approaching this small postage stamp floating on the sea <clears throat> at sp a speed that demands that the nose is cocked up well to slow the aircraft down and your view with this very long engine in front of you was quite appalling. So these two facts I think made the Spitfire <clears throat> um, unsuitable fundamentally for naval work. So one has to say, when you got it in the air, it was absolutely superb. But the operational losses were probably far higher than the um, losses that um, we inflicted on the combat, in, on the enemy in combat. Um, 
the C file. I was once told by a pilot early in my career on board a carrier that you should be bloody scared every time you did an approach because if you thought that you had this deck landing business wound up and that you knew all about it, you were headed for a fall. And I must say I have met, met two or three pilots that were very overconfident. I've got it made. I know how to do it and, and uh, this is what you do. A Seafire was a difficult aeroplane to deck land because it wasn't a straightforward approach because the nose was so long that to land it and to see the batsman, which is absolutely essential because he is governing what you do on the approach, you have to uh, implicitly obey all the signals that he gives you. You've got to be able to see him at all times. And the nose of the sea fire being so long, we had to approach in a curve and then the latter part of the approach was in a crab with a nose turned 10 degrees starboard. Now this is a dangerous type manoeuvre uh, when you're getting near to the stall. We were approaching at about 65 knots. Um, the, the RAF approach speed for the aircraft is 95 miles an hour. But we were full flaps down and the tail low and the nose uh, offset about 10 degrees so that we could see the batsman. And just before touching the deck, you've got to kick off the drift and land straight ahead. So it was difficult to land, but it was a technique that you could learn and you could apply, and it worked. But the fellow that thought that he had it all worked out, I have no trouble with this, it's easy. He was the guy that was usually headed for a fall. The thing about the Spitfire was that it had a very long uh, engine cowling in front of the pilot and the pilot's head was barely above the level of the engine cowling so the view below was negligible. You could only really see what went on ahead and below the aircraft by going into a turn and we had underestimated the difficulty of seeing sufficient to make a safe deck landing. The result was we had a number of accidents and the captain of the ship said that's enough um, we were to go ashore again and do more training uh, the, the snag about sea fires, uh, spitfires um, landing on a deck was that you couldn't, if you looked straight ahead, uh, you couldn't um, see the deck, it was difficult to see the deck, and you couldn't see the batting officer who was guiding you in. Uh, so you actually had to give a bit of right, ru right rudder. <clears throat> the batting officer was on your left as you came in, as you landed. <clears throat> you had to put on a bit of, keep it on a bit of right rudder so that you could see the nose. The nose of a sea fire was about, I think about 14 foot long. It was a very long nose. Whereas the Grumman market was tubby, and you could see uh, over the engine, you could easily see the, um, uh, the ground. And um, so we did a lot of practice later on, a lot of practice with sea fires, um, uh, doing uh, simulated deck, deck landings. Uh, the visibility of the Spitfire wasn't very good at the best of times, um, but when you had to it, when you had to land it at slow speed on a, on high throttle, you had to have the nose right up, and then you could see practically nothing ahead of you at all. That that was the biggest problem to get used to. Yeah. We had our various ways of doing it. You know, used to come in on a curve and used to put a head out of the side and all sorts of various ways, but most people cope with it. So the pilot cope, it was the aircraft really wasn't built for it, but quite a lot of accidents, mainly because of the aircraft didn't, uh, couldn't take the heavy landings. But, uh, it's a shame really because it was a beautiful airplane to fly, it was ideal for the Navy. They had a lot of success, but they did break an awful lot of airplanes. Yeah.
really. You, well, I mean, taking off is not so bad. You just because you know you you can't do much about it. You you put the brakes on uh, and rev up to full throttle, and then let the brakes off and hope for the best. Um, uh, there's nothing much else you can do about it. Uh, landing on is the difficult thing. As I say, on the sea fire, um, you had to come in on a curved approach with the the hood open, goggles on, leaning out of the side so that you could see the, the, the deck at all because the nose was right up in front of you. We came in at 68 knots um, and stalling speed was 63, so we only had five knots spare. Uh, and we came in and... Uh, well, I must have managed them all right, I suppose. But uh, certainly it was a bit of quite a tension, tense time. And there must have been that moment when the wheel touched, but you weren't sure if the hook had taken. How no, no, the hook touched first, usually, because it hung quite a long way down. This was another drawback of the sea fire. The hook was between the undercarriage and the tailplane. So you had to have be in the right attitude, otherwise the hook wouldn't catch. The Hellcat which was designed as a fleet fighter for a carrier, the hook was right at the stern after the tail wheel and it therefore hung right down and you could have the, as long as you had the tail low enough, you were pretty sure of catching a wire. But the sea fire uh, was, uh, I'm afraid, vulnerable on this point and there were a lot of casualties from landing, from deck landings. Another characteristic of the sea fire, not so engaging, was its, its desire to float. When you came in and cut the throttle, most, uh, most other aircraft would lose speed and drop. The sea fire had an engaging habit of just floating on a bit. They said, I want to go on flying. You know, <laughs> Cut the throttle and you just go on straight on. And that res was responsible for a lot of casualties and uh, because uh, on the deck of a carrier you have two barriers I'm not sure whether they went three so uh, with the fleet steaming into wind which may, may not be the way they wanted to go you had to steam into wind to get the flight the wind over the flight deck um, you could land on an aircraft uh, instead of having to wait to strike it down into the hangar on the lift you, the barriers came up the aircraft were stashed up for up in the bows and the next one could come on and so if it, it missed the wires, it wouldn't write off the aircraft on the bow as well. Um, well, that, 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 has, that happened more, than, more often than it should have done because, as I say, the Seafire was not designed as, as a fleet fighter. It was so airworthy, so f floated so easily that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't, the, f the hook didn't catch either because they were going too fast or because they floated or because they, again, because the hook was between the undercarriage and the tail wheel, didn't hang low enough. Thing with another thing I remember coming into land, now on the sea fire another hazard was if you operated the undercarriage too quickly, the wheels would drop out a little way and then get stuck. They, couldn't, they wouldn't go any further down. And the only remedy was to get them back into their seating in the aircraft. This meant turning upside down, flying upside down, pushing the stick well forward so that you get reverse G, reverse gravity, and the, uh, the, the uh, undercarriage would then slot back into its place, uh, which I had to do. And uh, all the toffee papers and cigarette, not cigarette, but toffee papers and dust and bits came out of the bottom of the cockpit into my face. I remember horrid feeling. But anyway, it worked and I was able to roll back again and make a safe landing. I'm afraid we lost, uh, we had a nasty accident on board and uh, that uh, killed uh, four of our pilots. Did you see it? I had just landed on just before it took place and I was, didn't actually see the last part. I heard, heard it, it, the, an aircraft went straight into the deck park forward of the barriers and uh, cleared every aircraft that was forward of the barriers. They were all pushed in the sea and unfortunately uh, some of our aircraft were, the pilots were still in the cockpit and they were trapped. Well, we lost some of our ground crew, were also lost. It didn't, wasn't all the air crew that were killed.
killed. Um, and, uh, well, there were no, weren't replacement aeroplanes, so that culminated the squadron. We flew ashore and uh, had to disband. Sadly, one of the outcomes of the Salerno operations was amongst senior naval officers not experienced in flying or operating aircraft, an opinion grew that the CFAR was a really very poor naval aircraft and could not be relied upon. They, of course, did not take into account because of their inexperience, the very adverse conditions under which they were operated at Salerno. And later on, it was to be found that certain senior officers did not operate their CFARs because they didn't trust them in conditions where they could perfectly well be operated. This was to be proved very soon in the operations in the south of France. Well, despite the dissatisfaction of certain senior officers in our aircraft, we had the greatest confidence in them. And we knew that given better conditions, we could do infinitely better. Now, statistically speaking, I, I, I regret to say I don't have accurate statistics, but there are some very interesting ones I remember particularly. First of all, for us, the great joy was that our carrier deck operations had absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to the disaster at Salerno. In fact, we had achieved an accident rate in deck landings of 1.6 accidents per thousand hours of flying, whereas ashore on the landing strips, the RAF was achieving 2.3 accidents per thousand hours. So in fact we were doing better in the carrier than they were doing on the landing strips ashore. Sure.